Hello. Uh, Mr. Jakir, this is Aurora Vivek. Being a Hindu, over here, I'm not over here to put any controversy, but I have a question. Aham Brahma, Aham Vishnu, Aham Mahesh, that was called by someone of my very good friend. Eventually, he was telling us about Quran and Bible. But what my question is, I have got just four questions to ask to you. Number one. Most important question first. Okay, I, if I, there is time, we would definitely permit you another no question. No issues, no issues. Because if everyone I, asks two, three questions, if I as a coordinator allow, I think we are not being fair to the other questioners. Fine, thank you. I got your point. Just one question. As though, Mr. Jake, you were talking about Genesis version and everything, I just have a put one question. If you are making a comparison between the Quran and Bible, why not a comparison between the Vedas, the Quran, and the Bible? They are versatile in each every manner. One each eventually is cooperated with each other. God, the Almighty is one. Rather, it called be as the Allah, it's called by Bhagwan or Jesus. Why not make it sure all of the people should say, why not only one? Brother asked a very good question, very important question, very practical question. When I'm making comparison between Quran and the Bible, why not make comparison between Quran, Bible, Veda, etc.? And he said that why don't you follow all? And that is what I tell the people that for the Quran says, Ta'ala wila kalmitin sawa im bainana Come to common terms as between us and you. Brother, what I tell every human being, any, whether it be a Hindu, Christian, Muslim, Jew, Sikh, Parthi, no problem. I tell them a simple thing which everyone will agree. At least agree that one scripture is the word of God. No one would mind doing that. The Hindu would say, okay, fine, Ved is the word of God. Christian will say, Bible is the word of God. Muslim will say, Quran is the word of God. The Sikh, he'll say, my Granth is the word of God. The Parsi, he will say that my Avesta is the word of God. No problem. Now, put all these scriptures together. What is common? Let us agree to follow that. What is not common, we can discuss that tomorrow. Frank, I only ask them one thing. What is common in all these scriptures, let us agree to follow. Because Sorry to interrupt you, sir. Sorry to interrupt you. Brother, please let me complete the answer. Uh, and please, after please, I, please, please, please. After, I finish, after I finish the answer, what you want, you can say. Maybe what you want to ask, I will give in the answer. Correct? I go in stepwise. Right, sir. The mathematical, if you want to solve a problem, if I directly give you the answer, you won't understand. I have to go stepwise. One, two, three, four. Fine. Exactly. So my only request is, what is common in all the scriptures, let us follow. What is not common, we'll discuss later on. Fine? Now, common in all the scripture is that God is one. So let us believe God is one. We say that God is one. Didn't I say that? Ikkam evidityam. God is only one without a second. Bible says that. Gospel of Mark. Chapter number 12, verse number 29. Book of Deuteronomy, chapter number 6, verse number 4. Shama Israel, O Adnai Harnai Khad. Yoro Israel, the Lord, our God is one. The Jews say that, the Christians say that. The Quran says, Kulwallah Wad. Say there's God one and only. So where does this Trinity come in between? Where does this Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva come in between? Where? I didn't believe in that. Brother, let me complete. There is no Brahma mentioned in the Quran. There is no Shiva mentioned in the Quran. There is no Jesus mentioned in the Quran that he's God. It's mentioned in the Quran, he's a messenger of God. The Bible also doesn't say that Jesus is God. It is the false reading of the Christians. So how come you are saying that it doesn't matter whether Allah, Jesus, it matters. The Quran says, in Surah Isra, chapter number 17, verse number 110, Kulidullah avidur rahman ayam atadu fala rasma husna. Say call upon him by Allah, or by Rahman, by whichever name you call upon him, to him belong the most beautiful names. It should be a beautiful name. It should not conjure up a mental picture. It should be a true name. You can't give a false name to God. You can't insult God. You can't belittle God. Some people tell me, what difference does it make? You call Pani, you call water, you call Tani. No problem. If you call Pani, you say in Hindi. Tani, you say in Tamil. Moya or Mai, you say in Arabic. Jal, you say in Hindi, no problem. 
You can call by any name. But then, one morning, my friend comes and tells me, every morning I have water. But after I have water, the doctor told me I have a lot of water. But I start vomiting. I said, why? No, the water is yellowish. The doctor told him to have water. He has every morning one glass of water. The water is yellowish. 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 Then I realized what he's talking is not water, it is urine. <laughs> you can't call urine as water. The definition of water, you can call Tani, you can call water, you can say Rahman, you can say Rahim, you can say Karim, you can say Rab. But you can't call God as man. You can't call God as insan. Therefore, you can't call water as urine. And the touchstone for theology is Surah Ikhlas, chapter number 112, verse number 1 to 4. What I mentioned in Surah Ikhlas. So what I'm going to tell, that what is different, keep it aside. Nowhere does the Quran say that Jesus is God. Nowhere does the Quran say Mahesh is God. So keep Mahesh out. Yes, if you say Brahma. Brahma is a Sanskrit word which is known as a creator God. So if you say creator, I've got no problem. If you say God is a creator, I've got no problem. Because Quran says that God is Khalik, creator. But then you say this creator has got four heads. He has got four hands. Then you're giving an image to God. You're going against Veda. Natasipatimasti. Of that God, there is no image. I do believe so. Call him creator. But you say that creator is a man, then he's not God. I do have an apology. Be the creator. So same way, brother, if you see my video cassette, similarities between Islam and Hinduism, inshallah, most of the carries will be answered. Hope that answers the question. I do apologize. What I was specifically want to say to you, Mr. Jakir, I do not want to get into controversy over here. Um, my thing is this, Mr. Jakir was telling appropriately right what exactly was over here the people is wanting. What I wanted to know, basically, exactly what he, the speeches he is providing to us, we are over to listen him. Exactly the Renaissance, the Renaissance, the creator of the world, rather it should be counted as Allah, Bhagwan, or the Jesus, should not be created in self. It has to be materialized with differentiations. Thank you. Brother, if you had heard my answer, you call him Allah, I've got no problem. You call him Bhagwan. As long as what is the meaning of Bhagawan? According to Rajnish, Bhagawan means something else. I don't know whether you know. According to Rajnish, what definition Rajnish gave, then I cannot believe God is Bhagawan. So what we have to realize, we have to believe in the concept of the Almighty, the Creator, the Maker. If you know that concept, and the word should be chosen correct. It should not be a wrong word. And what word is common between the scriptures, we have got no objection. But Jesus, as you again mentioned, is not common in the Bible and the Quran. Quran says Jesus is the prophet of God, and even the Bible says the prophet of God, but the Christians, they misunderstand that Jesus claimed divinity. So if the Christians, they misunderstand the Bible, why should I agree with the misunderstanding? I have to clarify that. I have not come here to create a controversy. I have come here to come to common terms. Come to common terms, I have been asking you. Yes, can we have the next question from the sister? I'm Dr. Pooja Arora. I'm from Sign Hospital. I'm a physiotherapist. Uh, so I totally agree with you. Just a small question. When uh, Muhammad Prophet attained his prophethood, uh, and he, as you said, he was a common man before he attained prophethood, by that time, is it that uh, Quran, which is the word of God, has enlightened only Muslims? because God can't be partial. So what was the rest of the world doing when Muhammad Prophet was enlightening a small sect of people? And is it that such a long time is being taken for the rest of the sector of society to just get enlightened to this word of God? And how many years would the non-Muslims, like Hindus would, uh, I totally agree with you, it has to be a concept. Hindus are believing idols, pictures, but or Ram, Bhagwan, whatever. But it is a concept, and they have to be enlightened about it, that it is one. 
Hinduism also follows uh, an almighty, which is a power, a divine power, but unfortunately it has been given in various forms. So this enlightenment, if Quran helps a Hindu to know this enlightenment, it is fabulous. Sister has asked a very good question and a very important question. She said that if Quran is such a great book, if it's the word of Almighty God, then why, when it came to Prophet Muhammad, it was only meant for that small group, you know, Arabs of that time, only Muslim, why not for the full world? How long will it take? Sister, the Quran was never revealed only for the Muslims or for the Arabs. The Quran was revealed for the whole of humanity. It's mentioned in Surah Ibrahim, chapter number 14, verse number 1. In Surah Ibrahim, chapter number 14, verse number 52. In Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 185. And Surah Zumur, chapter number 39, verse number 41. That the Quran was sent for the whole of humanity. Time is short, therefore I'm only giving references, not the quotations. The Quran was not sent only for the Muslims and the Arabs. The Quran was sent for the whole of humanity. And Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he was not sent only for the Muslims and the Arabs. The Quran says in Surah Ambiya, chapter number 21, verse number 107. وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةِ الْعَالَمِينَ That we have sent thee not but as a mercy to all the human beings, as a mercy to all the worlds, as a mercy to all the creatures. The message is repeated in Surah Sabah, chapter number 34, verse number 28, that Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is sent as a universal messenger, giving glad tidings and warning them against sins. But most of the human beings yet do not know. Now this verse of the Quran says, most of the human beings yet do not know. That's the reason, sister, we are having such conferences. It's the duty of every Muslim that should convey the word of Almighty God to all the human beings. So, uh, one more thing, sir. Can it I ask? It may take time, but better late than never, sister. Better late than never. And everyone who claims to be a Muslim may not be a practicing Muslim. He may have a name, Abdullah Zakir, Muhammad Sultan, but he may not be a practicing Muslim. Similarly, as you rightly said, in Hinduism, you don't follow your scriptures. But yet, the religion which is the maximum followed, not only by lip service, but in practice today, it is Islam, number one. In numbers, Christianity, it is close to 2 billion. Muslims claiming is 1.3 billion. But the people practicing the religion, number one is Islam. Percentage-wise, it is the largest. So these lectures are mainly those small percentage of Muslims who are not following Islam correctly to get them closer to Islam. And to those non-Muslims, we want to give the message of peace, the message of love, and prove to the world that there is only one God. The ultimate peace can only come if you submit a will to Almighty God. That is the only way to get ultimate peace in this world and thereafter. So that is the reason, sister, we are having such conferences. We have a satellite channel, Peace TV, where every day more than 60 million people, they're watching it. So at least on the Day of Judgment, we can give shahada to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ya Rab, we did our best, whatever we could. We at least gave the message every day at least to 60 million people. And today, the message has even reached you, sister. So tomorrow, on the Day of Judgment, I can tell to Almighty God, I gave the message to the sister. Whether you accept or not is in your hand, sister. I just want to add, can I? Thank you very much, sir. Uh, just one more thing, if, because God is impartial, so on the day of judgment, as you did a partiality that uh, non-Muslims should be given first priority to ask their questions, God is impartial. So if Hindus stop believing in idols and pictures and they start believing in the Almighty, which has got no form, no shape, and on the day of judgment, is it that they will be not behaved as Muslims by God? No, it is not like that. It is the concept which is there in Hinduism, the misbelief that is followed in forms. But if, and Hindu, following Hindu religion is not wrong, but following, because your aim is God. He is the supreme. He should not have form. Very but good if question. this message is reached to Hinduism, you have won it. Very good, sister. Very good question. Thank you, sir. Regarding we being partial and impartial, there can be two different views from your side. <laughs> because we're partial, at least you could ask a question. <laughs> if I wasn't partial, I couldn't tell to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I gave you the message directly one to one. You know? 
So he doesn't. He doesn't believe. So what we have to realize, sister? But why we are partial? We are partial to be impartial, because the others have got the message. If not 100 percent, 90 percent, you all have got less. So we are partial to be impartial. Right, sir. So what we need now, to. Now coming back to your question, sister. <laughs> yes, it's sir. It's a very good question. That if the Hindus believe in one God, do not believe in idols, do not believe in images, do not believe in statues. On the day of judgment, won't we be Muslims? Correct. You are following part of Islam. Correct. If you read the Hindu scriptures further, the Hindu scriptures say there is another messenger to come. And the coming of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, has been prophesied in various places. He's prophesied in Bhavishya Purana, Parva 3, Khanda 3, Adhyat 3, Shloka 5 to 8. He's prophesied in Bhavishya Purana, Parva 3, Khanda 3, Adhyat 3, Shloka 10 to 27. He's prophesied in the Atharva Ved, chapter number 21, verse number 6. Atharva Ved, chapter number 21, verse number 7. He's prophesied in several places. He is mentioned by name no less than 100 times as Muhammad in the Hindu scriptures. Right, Time sir. doesn't permit me to mention all the references. There's mention of a Kalki Avatar in Kalki Purana, chapter number two, verse number four, five, seven, nine, eleven, and 15. It says that there is another Avatar to come, Kalki Avatar, whose father's name shall be the servant of God, Vishnu Yash, translated into Arabic as Abdullah, which was the name of the father of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The mother's name of this Kalki Avatar would be Sumati, that means peace and serenity, which is Amina in Arabic, which was the name of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, mother. This person would be born on the 12th day of Madhav, the 12th Rabbi Awal, that is the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, born. He'll have four companions, and we know the first for Khulfa Rashidin. It says that he will be born in a place which is peaceful, in Makkah. He'll be born in a house of the chief of Makkah, that is the Quraysh tribe. It says that he will go northward from a cave and come back. And Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam went from Makkah to Medina and came back. On and on talking about Kalki Avatar. So you believe in one part, La ilaha illallah, you also Muhammad have to believe in Muhammad Rasulullah. Thank you, sir. Thank you. And if you do this, you keep your name, whatever your name was, whether Preeti, whatever name, sister, what is the name, sister? Pooja. Pooja. You keep your name. Don't change your name. But indeed, you will be a Muslim. Changing your name is not required. So the concept? With concept of one God, no statue, no images, last final messenger, Prophet Muhammad, Inshallah, on the day of judgment, you will go to heaven with your name Puja. So the pathways are different. The only thing is the goal should be the same. That is no, what sister. I believe. For the goal, pathways are different. If both the different pathways go to meet, the same goal, they it is fine. meet at the same goal. Yes, sir. That is what I want to say. All the roads don't lead to Rome, sister. Fine? You may think it will lead. So if you think falsely, I have to correct you. I don't can, believe, no sir. Uh, no, no sir. sister, if you say you're a Hindu, by yeah. definition, yeah. Hindu is a person who lives in India. No sir, it's not like that. Sister, <laughs> Hindu is a geographical definition. You don't know, I know, I'm a Hindu by geographical definition. I'm a Hindu. Geographically, sister, the word Hindu was first used by the Arabs. There are many Arabs here. They call me Hindi when I go there, hey, Hindi, Hindi. <laughs> They tell I'm a Hindu. The word Hindu was first used by the Arabs when they came to India. It was also used by the Persians to describe the people who lived in India. So geographically, I'm a Hindu. But if you tell me religiously, Hindu is a misnomer. Swami Vivekananda said, the right term is a Vedantist. You should follow the Vedas. So as far as you follow the right things in the Veda, believe in one God and believing in Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, by deed, you are a Muslim. So the religion can't be powerful. The it ultimate is. power is Allah. Correct. Right? I ultimate agree with power you. is God. And the so religion of God. And the religion of God is the ultimate religion. So the There's religion of God religion. is not Islam. Mm. The religion of God is not Islam. Islam, isn't it? if Islam is an Arabic word which is hurting you, you keep Islam aside. No, no. no. I, it's not hurting me. I'm telling it's you, sister. It's not hurting me. If it's not hurting you, nobody. No, sir. It is a park word in itself. How it can hurt anybody? At least not an educated girl. Mashallah, you're an educated girl, sister. Yes. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, sister, sir. Sister, Islam means submitting your will to God. So if Islam is a problem, keep Islam aside, but submit your will to God. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Al-Imran, chapter 3, verse number 19, in the dina in the light Islam, the only religion, the only way of life accepted in the sight of Allah is submitting our will to Almighty God. Yes, brother.
Mr. Naik, uh, this is myself, Dr. Suryakant Pawar from St. George Hospital. Uh, thanks for the nice and enlightening lecture about the Quran as God's word. As you mentioned that Quran is God's word, I just want to ask you, who is the creator of the God? What is the origin of God? The brother asked a very good question, that if Quran is the word of God, who is the creator of God? Very good question. If I ask you, brother, that your friend John, he gave birth to a child. Can you guess the child was a girl or a boy? Your friend John gave birth to a child in the hospital. Can you guess was it a girl or a boy? Guess, guess? No. Girl I, or a boy? I can't guess. Sorry? I may not guess. Try. At least 50% you will get right. Yeah, 50%. One half chance. Okay, tell me. Boy. Boy. <laughs> Whether can a man give birth to a child? No. So is it a girl or a boy? But the name can be for a female. I'm asking you, your friend, John. <laughs> I don't know anyone female called by John. No, we can call. Nah. Okay, suppose a friend who is a boy, is a man. He went to hospital. He gave birth to a child. Was it a girl or a boy? Girl. <laughs> <laughs> can a man give birth to a child, brother? No. <laughs> ah, now you understood. A man can't give birth to a child. So where's the question of it being girl or a boy? So by definition, God is uncreated. So a question, who is the creator of God, is like I asking you a question, your no. friend who's a man, he gave birth to a child, is it a girl or a boy? The question is illogical. Because by definition, a man cannot give birth to a child. So where's the question of girl or a boy? So by definition, God is uncreated. Every created thing has a creator, God does not have a creator. Therefore, in my argument with the atheist, I never ever said that everything has a creator. I said every created thing has a creator. But the God is uncreated. By definition, the moment I mention who is the creator of God, he is not God. Therefore, by definition, God is uncreated. Hope that answers the question. Okay. Thank you. The next question from the brother in the back. My name is Peter. I'm a student of religion, philosophy. Now, my question is on the textual authenticity of the Quran. First, when uh, Abu Bakr commanded Zayd to gather the text together, he did that. But there is also written in Al-Bukhari, volume number 5, page 96, Abdul ibn Masud, he was the uh, authority mentioned by Muhammad, he gathered a text. Then Salim, the freed slave, he gathered a text. And also uh, Ubay ibn Kaab, a master reciter mentioned by Muhammad. And there are also other people who compiled their test. But when Usman became the Khalifa, he ordered Zayed to make replicas, seven replicas of his text and sent it to the different parts and ordered those previous texts to be burned. Now, if those master reciters compile the Quran and Usman ordered those texts to be burned, now there raises a question on the authenticity of the Quran. MashaAllah, brother knows about Ibn Masood, may Allah be with him, about Zayd Ibn Thabit, may Allah be peace with him. MashaAllah, many of the Muslims will not know those names. You know, now it's easy to go on the internet. Jesus Christ, peace be upon said in the Gospel of John, chapter number 8, verse number 32, seek the truth and the truth shall free you. Now when internet is there, many people go on the internet, there are various websites which are speaking against Islam. They go, they get the name and they decide, no problem, brother. No problem. Brother, as far as your question is concerned, the people who compiled the Quran, there was a group of Sahaba, the companion of the Prophet. Whenever Prophet got a revelation, he repeated it to these scribes. 
And suppose, Ikra bismi rabbika ladhi khalaq, khalaq al-insana min Allah. He got the revelation, and Prophet, mashallah, very good memory, Allah saw to it that he retained the memory, he repeated it. When he repeated, these scribes wrote down. The Prophet personally verified, he was an ummi. How did he verify? Okay, read it now. Ikra bismi rabbika ladhi khalaq. Ah, correct. So Prophet personally verified when he was alive, whatever was written down of the Quran, whether it was perfect or not. Under his personal supervision. And these scribes, they were selected by the Prophet, and that's how when the revelation came in 22 and a half years, all was written down and later compiled in one book. All supervised by Prophet Muhammad, even the order. Now, later on, there were many other people, whenever the Prophet said a verse was revealed, they used to write in his own notes. Many, many sahabas. But this private notes of the other people weren't checked by the Prophet. Suppose the teacher gives the notes. 100 students are copying. How do I know whether it's right or wrong? If I'm giving a lecture, if some people note down, chapter number, verse number, chapter number, verse number, how fast can they note down? And if I don't verify, they say, oh, Dr. Naik, you said this reference. Where did I say it? Have I checked it? So what happened later on, there were many variants version of the Quran. Version means people thought their own notes to be the real Quran. And when Islam spread, people did not know which was the real Quran. So at that time, whatever the compiled copy was there, when Hazrat Abu Bakr Malai believed with him, during these scribes, it was then in the hand of the wife of Prophet. Hazrat Hafsa may Allah be pleased with her. And then Usman ordered that copy, may Allah be pleased with him and had a replication so that it could be sent to different parts of the world. And then he said, whatever copy you have, whether right or wrong, you burn it. Because that hasn't been verified. So people had their own notes. Suppose someone makes notes of my lecture, there are people making here notes. Maybe 80% is right, 90%, 100% is very difficult. Correct? 100% is very difficult. So 80%, even if it's 100% correct, if I give you now, this is the book of my lecture. You know, you'll be getting a book now. Quran and modern science. Authenticated by me. Your notes, you throw it away. Why does he require the notes? I have given you a book. Anyway, you aren't getting the full lecture. You're getting part of the lecture, Quran, modern science. Now that part, I'll tell you, brother, throw that notes away. This is correct. Authenticated by me, Dr. Zakir Naik. My book. The same way, whatever was authenticated by the Prophet, the revelation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Hadad Usman, may Allah be pleased with him. He said, all the other copies should be burned. That does not mean there was variant Quran. There was one Quran that was revealed. But people, when they wrote with their own notes, there were differences. So that's the reason now one of those copies is even today present in Koptaki Museum in Istanbul. So this, and if you check it with today's Musaf, it is exactly the same, word to word, letter to letter. That's the way. Even if you try to change it, you cannot, because today there are millions of people who know the Quran by heart. And here in our audience, mashallah, we have many huffas, mashallah, who know the Quran by heart. Even if you burn the copy, you get all the huffas together, you get together, again the original Quran, word to word, letter to can be reproduced. Hope that answers the question. But isn't it the same with the master reciters at the time of Muhammad and the Zayed's text was compiled only after the death of Muhammad? That's totally wrong to say that. What we have to realize that Zayd ibn Thabit, he was appointed as the chief of the scribes. There were many sahabas together. He was appointed as the chief. And this was personally verified by Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And later on, at the time of Hazrat Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, it was made into a book form. Because at that time, there was not paper. There was no pen. It was written on parchment, on bones, on blades, on different material. Then it was later transferred to one uniform material and made into a book form. Nowhere does it say that there were different versions. So all these scribes, even when it was written down again, when Hazrat Usman, when he ordered Malai peace with him, those people who were alive in the group of the scribes, he called them. And among them again, Zayd ibn Thabit, he was appointed as the leader. Hope that answers the question. Yes, sister. Can we have the next question? Uh, brother Zakir Naik, Assalamu Alaikum. I'm Namita, a kindergarten teacher by profession. 
First of all, let me congratulate you for all your commendable work in spreading the message of peace, love, and brotherhood. I want to ask you, Brother Nayak, if Quran is the God's word, if Islam is truly the way of life, then why are people taking so long in realizing and accepting it? Sister, that's a very good question. Quran is the word of God, Islam is the true religion. Why are people taking so long in accepting it? Sister, the straight path is not always easy to follow. Your perception differs. The perception of each individual differs. For example, a person who may not be following Islam, oh, if I accept Islam, he may be an alcoholic. I'll have to stop having alcohol. I may have to stop going out with girls and dating. So then that will prevent him. So what he thinks, OK, fine, Islam may be good, but I don't want to stop my alcohol. I don't want to stop going out flirting with girls. I don't want to stop having pork. So when you learn, there may be certain hitches that may come. Maybe a person may not be alcoholic. Maybe he may not be having pork, but he may think, OK, now I accept Islam. That means for 40 years I was a fool. Oh, I better not accept Islam. Some may think, if I accept Islam, what will my friends say? What will my mother say? What will my father say? So all these obstacles, sister, only if you can overcome these obstacles, can you accept the truth. So therefore, what you have to realize, that the message is clear. The message is logical. It's absolutely clear. But there are other things which are there in the baggage. A person has to be so strong that, fine, if this is the truth, I'm ready to accept the truth, even if I have to leave my other non-Muslim friends. And believe me, sister, this is only a perception. And many non-Muslims who have accepted Islam, and yet they've got their old friends. And people tell me, oh, Zakir, don't speak to non-Muslims, you lose their friendship. I've got very good non-Muslim friends also. Mashallah, they respect me. You have appreciated me. Mashallah, you're a non-Muslim. So my job is to present the truth. And one more thing, Quran clearly mentioned in Surah Baqarah, chapter number two, verse number 256, like Rafid Deen, there's no compulsion religion. Truth stands out clear from error. Our job, sister, is to present the truth. Whether a person accepts it or not, it depends upon him. If Almighty God wanted everyone to accept, it's very easy. It's mentioned in the Quran in Surah Yunus, chapter number 10, verse number 99. If he wanted, he could have made all the human beings believers. Very easy. Kun fa kun, very easy. But where is the test? Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Mulk, chapter number 67, verse number 2, Allah di khalakal mawata wal hayata. It's Allah who has created death and life to test which of you is good in deeds. So this life, sister, is a test for the hereafter. Now when a person realizes the truth, everything you realize the truth, you don't follow. You may follow 80%, you may follow 50%. There are very few people who follow 100%. Even all the Muslims don't follow 100%. Some Muslims may have bad habit, yet, they are Muslim. So what have realized, sister, the major points of oneness of God and believing in the last and final messenger and believing in the hereafter, these two, three points are the most important, sister. And that's the same thing I'll tell you, sister. You ask me the question, I'll ask you the same question. Then what is taking you so much time to accept the truth, sister? Dr. Zakir Naik, I would just like to tell you something, that here, with your blessings, I accept Islam and repeat the kalma, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasool Allah. MashaAllah, sister, may Allah, may Allah bless you. And may Allah come to Jannah, inshallah, sister. And welcome you, sister. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you and come to Jannah, ameen. Uh, may we have the next question from the brother in the front. Firstly, sir, congratulations for arranging this program. I am advocate Shivaji Sapkar from Bid, Maharashtra. This program is peace for all over. I get the opportunity to ask question. 
बट माय क्वेश्चन इज नॉट रिलेटेड कुरान यस सर यस सर देर आर लैक्स ऑफ मराठी स्पीकर्स आय ऑल्सो मराठी वॉट इज द रोल ऑफ आई आर एफ मीन्स इस्लामिक रिसर्च फाउंडेशन वॉट आई आर एफ डूइंग फॉर मराठी और नॉन मुस्लिम्स Well, that's a very good question. Since we are living in the state of Maharashtra, he is asking, "What are we doing as far as Marathi is concerned, and what are we doing for non-Muslims?" As far as Marathi is concerned, I'll be very frank with you. We want to do, but we aren't doing much. There are some of my books being translated to Marathi by others, because I can understand Marathi, but I can't speak Marathi. I mean, I should be able to do it. we are trying to make our children speak many languages but i can understand marathi but i can't speak a little bit i can but i don't master over the language or maybe then i would have given lectures in marathi also but we have some speakers in irf who give lectures in marathi we have brother abdul gafur qureshi whenever there is a request to speak in marathi we send him so what we are doing we are training people to speak and convey the message of peace in different languages the training program is in english and many people know three four languages so the training program is in english sometimes in urdu and hindi then he goes if he is coming from south africa from africa then he speaks in african language many people are coming from other parts of the world from malaysia they have come they have come from usa they have come from singapore from saudi arabia from philippine tagalu i don't know tagalu what i do i convey the message in english i tell the people to convey in tagalu i am requesting you brother convey my message what you have learned here heard here to those people on marathi you will be doing a favor to me yes yes sir inshallah yes. that's the first question come to the second question what are we doing for non muslims again we aren't doing much whatever limited we can do there's so much to be done the organization is big mashallah we have got more than 2000 volunteers yet i'm saying we are doing nothing we are a very small organization very small we have organized this conference we are giving first chance to non muslims because you are a vip guest a special guest you today are more closer to me than the other muslims why because i have to convey the allah will ask me on the day of judgment how i convey the message or not so i am trying my level best to convey personally on this level furthermore this conference the 10 day conference we have invited non muslim and we mentioned in the posters all faith welcome people of all religion welcome but in question and answer session we give them first preference we give them priority so that the doubts can be cleared even the muslim have got doubts the muslim they get angry with me not the zakir what about us after work kal dekh lenge no problem okay okay kal matlab abhi kal ne ab 10 din ke baad dekh lenge so what we have besides giving the message here maybe the tens of thousands of people here now mashallah tens of thousands of people but there are more than 60 million people watching live but yet we are doing nothing rf per se islam research foundation what we should do we are doing very little but we are trying a level best and we pray to allah subhanahu wa taala that may accept our humble effort that we are doing in trying to spread his message to the world hope that's the question we show all the best for your organization sir Uh, yes brother the next question my name is sahil i am a graphic designer i am a poet may peace be on you dr zakir i always wanted to say this i've got a chance by god's grace today i love you dr zakir i love you very very much and i thank you may peace be on you too brother and i thank you i too love you brother i too love you brother thank you and i thank you for the ample amount of knowledge i've got going through your lectures from my friends from my sister nagma and there's a slight bit of confusion uh between the word of god and the people who believe the concept of judgment day like there's a small question we believe like like the muslims believe that on the judgment day the dead will be put life in them and some of the muslims believe that it will be on the first night in the grave that the dead will be put life and there'll be 
azab and questions and answers in, in the grave. So I just wanted to clarify this. That's it. The brother asked the question that the difference of opinion, will life be put on the day of judgment, on the day of judgment resurrected, or will it be in the cover? Brother, if you read the hadith that is mentioned of the azab of cover, Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Imran, chapter number 3, verse 185, that Kullu nafsin zaykatul maud. Every soul shall have a taste of death. But the final recompense will be on the day of judgment. This life is just mere chattels of play and deception. But the final hisab kitab, final judgment is on the day of judgment. What we have to do, we may get part of the punishment in this world, part of the reward in this world, part of the reward in the qabar, part of the azab in the qabar, but the final, ultimate judgment is on the day of judgment. The final total of good and bad will be recorded on the day of judgment and then based on your deeds, you will either go to heaven or hell. Some of this will be given in this world, some in the grave, but the final accounting will be on the day of judgment. Hope that answers the question. Thank you. Yes, sister. Hi, I'm an American student studying culture and theology, and I have a question. You said Jesus never claims his divinity, and that Jesus was only here for Jews. But the Bible says, tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. And Jesus replied, yes, it is as you say. And then in Matthew 28, 18 through 20, Jesus says to his disciples, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Sister has quoted two verses from the Bible. The first one from Mr. Taken, you said that Jesus claimed that you are son of God. Did you say that, sister? Yes, sir. Son of God. And second, she said that Jesus said, go to all the nations. What she's quoting is the ending last portion of the Gospel of Matthew. If you go earlier, sister, it's mentioned in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 15, verse number 24. He says to his apostles that I have been sent not but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. What you quoted according to the scholars of the Bible, what they say, that is an interpolation. But whether it is or not, I don't argue. But then there's a contradiction in the Bible. The Bible clearly mentions in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 10, verse number 5 and 6, Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, says to the apostles, go ye not into the way of the Gentiles, go ye not into the way of the non-Jews, the Hindus, the Muslims, but rather go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. As far as the first question is concerned, that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said that I am the son of God. Sister, do you know, in the Bible, God has got sons by the tons. Adam was the son of God. Ephraim was son of God. Israel was son of God. All those who are led by the Spirit of God, they are sons of God. So if you are a righteous person, you are a son of God. If I'm a righteous person, I'm a son of God. That is the language of the Bible. As far as calling son of God to a righteous person, I do agree that since prophet Jesus was the messenger of God, he should be called the son of God. But what do the Christian missionaries say? No, 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 no. He is not a normal son. He is the begotten son. And they quote the Bible, Gospel of John, chapter number 3, verse number 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. So what we have to realize that this verse of the Bible, begotten son, According to the 32 scholars of the highest eminence of 50 corporate denominations, if you read the RSV, Revised Standard Version, they say this word begotten is interpolation, is a concoction, is a fabrication, and the throne of the Bible. So Jesus is not the begotten son, because begotten means it belongs to an action of animals of lower level. So he is verily the son of God. Son meaning a righteous person, we have no objection, but he's not the begotten son. He begets not, nor is begotten. I hope that answers the question. Uh, Jazakallah khair, we thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for making this program possible. 
We know you have many questions, but there are time limitations to the program. We thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not only for making this program possible, but for creating this opportunity for a better understanding on the topic for the millions of people too, other than those present here watching us on television, who may inshallah share some of the learnings from this talk and question and answer sessions to others less aware, for them to gain better understanding and hidayah too. We thank all who have contributed and made this program practically possible for all present here today and for its telecast and those who have come to attend this program. Jazakallah khair.